Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the truly frightening case of Sharon Galligan, a 20-year-old university student from Massachusetts. On the evening of the 18th of December 1989, Sharon a junior psychology major at the University of Massachusetts, decided to go to the Hampshire Mall at Hadley for some last-minute Christmas shopping. She worked part-time on the balloon stand at the mall, but wasn't scheduled to work that evening. Sharon arrived at the mall at around 8pm, parking her blue Dodge Colt in a well-lit spot around 50 metres from the entrance to Steiger's department store. She visited three shops, making a few purchases, before returning to her car shortly before 10pm, when the mall was due to close. At around 6.30pm the following day, another busy pre-Christmas shopping day, a woman who had been shopping with her young son noticed someone's foot resting against the passenger side window of Sharon's car. She looked inside and saw Sharon's body. The woman notified the mall officials who in turn called the police. The area was cordoned off and those who were parked nearby were unable to return to their vehicles. The police were faced with a crime scene so grisly that it affected even veteran police officers. Sharon was upside down in the car. Her head was pointing towards the floor on the driver's side and her legs were over the passenger seat. One of the legs was clearly visible through the passenger side window. Sharon was fully dressed in her winter clothes. She had been stabbed multiple times in the throat and abdomen and it was concluded that she had been killed inside her car. The police believed that the unusual positioning of her body could have been as a result of a fierce battle with her killer. Additionally, her body was frozen and it was believed that she had been killed the previous evening. Sharon's handbag with her purse and credit cards, together with her shopping, was still in the car. This meant the police ruled out robbery as a motive. Also, there were no signs of sexual assault. Sharon's father Paul was told of the murder. He then had to drive to tell his former wife what had happened before they made their way to the morgue in order to identify the body of their only daughter. The autopsy confirmed that Sharon had died from multiple stab wounds to the throat and torso, the most serious of which caused a major injury to the vessels near her heart. Her time of death was estimated to have been at around 10pm the previous evening and her body had remained in the car park of the mall for more than 20 hours during the busiest shopping season of the year. As news of the murder broke, There were multiple reports of people who had seen Sharon's foot at the car window as they passed by, but incorrectly assumed that she was working on the radio and as such did nothing. The police said that a person would have needed to look directly down into the car to see what had happened. As the investigation began, it became clear that Sharon did not have any enemies. She was a popular young lady who had graduated from Framingham High School in 1987 Her high school vice principal described her as a bright, vivacious and wonderful young woman and a good student. Sharon then went to the University of Massachusetts where she was a junior psychology major as well as being a research assistant and undergraduate teaching assistant in the psychology department. On the night of her murder, she should have already travelled home for Christmas but had stayed on campus to help correct papers. Sharon was close to both of her parents, speaking to them several times a week. She had many friends, enjoyed sports, taught aerobics, did volunteer work and had a perfect 4.0 grade average and was top of her class. She was interested in psychology, law and Spanish and was due to spend the following semester studying at the University of Seville in Spain. One of her university professors Robert Feldman, described her as being far above the average student in intelligence, work habits and interests. Her mother and father described her as a parent's dream. She had grown up in a family where they focused on helping others. Both her parents were psychology majors, with her mother becoming a teacher 
and her father, the Assistant Chief Probation Officer at Framingham District Court. Her paternal grandfather was a Cambridge detective who had arrested the Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo. Sharon lived in the High Omega Sorority House at the university with about 50 other young women. She loved the loud family atmosphere and had made lots of friends. She had also recently started dating a young man. As the investigation got underway further, the police urged the public to come forward with any possible information. Family, friends, acquaintances and Sharon's boyfriend were all questioned and ruled out as suspects. The possibility remained that this was a random attack carried out by a complete stranger, therefore making the investigation even more difficult. Employees at the mall were jittery, particularly when walking to and from the poorly lit employee parking lot. By the 21st of December, a couple of hundred calls had been logged with information relating to the crime. Two days before Christmas, Sharon was laid to rest at St Stephen's Cemetery in Framingham. The ceremony was attended by hundreds of mourners, including many of Sharon's sorority sisters. The police worked tirelessly chasing down leads and exploring all possible avenues related to the crime. Could this have been related to a similar mall attack on a woman in Connecticut? A male motorist had been in the area asking for help in starting his car at the same time as the murder. Could he have been involved or seen something that would be of use? Was there any link to several obscene phone calls that mall employees had received in the preceding weeks? Was the murder linked to reports of a woman enduring a threatening, menacing encounter in her car on the same night as the murder? Could the murder be related to a man who visited a Northampton store looking at daggers and behaving very suspiciously? Despite these and many other leads, together with plenty of suspects, the police could not find a solid link between Sharon's death and any of the possible perpetrators. Early the following year, it was reported that a shopper may have witnessed the murder, but dismissed it without realising what they had seen. Whilst waiting for her partner to use the ATM, a woman believed that she saw a couple having a disagreement before the man walked away towards McDonald's. With the help of hypnosis, the woman was able to give a detailed description of the man, including specific details that led the police to believe her information was credible. She described a white male, believed to be in his early 20s, between 5 foot 8 and 5 foot 10 inches tall. He had light short hair, a thin face and nose, and was of thin build. The man was wearing a full length dark wool coat and a dark knit ski hat with a white patch in the centre. A composite drawing was released, leading to hundreds more calls being received by the police. However, the investigation continued to hit dead end after dead end. In May 1990, a 35-year-old woman, Cheryl Kozalek, was found strangled to death under a blanket in the back seat of her car at the Emerald Square shopping mall in North Attleboro, which was about 100 miles from the place where Sharon was murdered. This too was investigated and ruled not to have any connection to Sharon's death. Despite everyone's best efforts, no progress was made. Then, in February 1991, it was reported that a Hampshire County Jail inmate by the name of William J. Schumann, who was awaiting trial on charges of setting fire to the Northampton Area Mental Health Service building, had confessed to Sharon's murder. In a letter dated January 1991, he said that he had met Sharon on campus and even though he did not like her, he kept talking to her, adding that when she told me she was majoring in psychology, that was enough for me to hear, and that as a psychology major, she would have grown up to be a torturer and murderer. In fact, she was already plying her trade while in college. In the letter, he stated that he had stabbed her a bunch of times, and then in the postscript stated that I didn't want the ring and that bleep dog. Whilst the police did not comment on the specifics, there were many inconsistencies between what William said and what they knew of the murder. 
he was subsequently ruled out of having any involvement. It would take until the 18th of January 1993, 37 months after the murder took place, for it to be announced that the case had finally been solved. The previous week, the police had brought 34-year-old Kenneth Mitchell of Granby in for questioning. Kenneth resembled the composite drawing released a couple of years prior. Kenneth's name had been amongst the hundreds of names that came up in the early part of the investigation, but had only become a prime suspect when the police had been contacted with incriminating evidence in December 1992. This led to interviews with Kenneth's ex-wife, Denise Marie Seconder, who told the police that Kenneth had told her back in December 1989 that he had killed the girl at the Hampshire Mall and had a bite mark on his left hand that had occurred during the struggle. Denise went on to say that at the time of the killing, Kenneth was having personal problems due to his mother's illness and had said to her that he was mad at God and wanted to strike back. He said that he had gone to the Hampshire Mall with the intention of taking his own life, but when he saw Sharon walk into her car, he decided to kill her instead. Kenneth threatened to kill Denise if she went to the police. Denise told her second husband, Walter Edgett, what Kenneth had told her. The following month, Kenneth also told Walter directly. Denise and Walter made a pact with Kenneth not to go to the police with the information if he promised to leave them alone. Around the time of the murder, at least two other people were aware of Kenneth's confession but did not report this to the police. When Kenneth moved away from the area, Denise finally went to the police with what she knew. On Thursday the 14th of January, Kenneth, who had no history of violent crime, was questioned and denied any involvement in Sharon's death. An additional interview was scheduled for the following day, but Kenneth didn't show up. His body was found in a motel room on Sunday the 16th of January. He had taken his own life in an act that police believe had little to do with guilt and everything to do with the certainty that he was about to get caught. Kenneth left a six-page note with a detailed confession admitting to Sharon's murder. The killing had been totally random and without motive. It could have happened to anyone who had walked out of the mall at that time. The discovery of his body brought about a sudden end to over three years of investigation and obvious relief that the case had finally been solved but with it some frustration that the police could never get all of the answers that they had been desperately searching for. That concludes today's case. Please add any comments down below. Also, I covered seven cases in seven days last week. If you missed any of the episodes, please try to watch them to help the channel. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Well, well, well. Look who is back. Sharon's old school, Framingham High School has many scholarships that they distribute. I'm glad to tell you there is one in Sharon Galligan's memory. Goodbye.